Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's CPG Masterclass Series webinar with Russell Warner on your personal practice plan to develop coaching skills. First of all, welcome to everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, just before we do get started, just make sure your microphones are muted as always, but you can also keep your screens on if you want to, so we can see who's there, who's listening in, and uh, say hello. We'll be recording the webinar as always and uploading it onto the Masterclass Series hub page afterwards. So if you miss anything or if you sort of uh, missed a detail on the Q&A, for example, you can refer back to that. And that's on the Masterclass Hub page. We'll also allocate a bit of time afterwards for a short Q&A with Russell. So if you do have any questions, if you just post them in the uh, chat option in the bottom of your screen, that'd be really good. And then I will coordinate five, 10 minutes to get through as many as we can if, if, and, if, and, if and when we do have some questions for Russell. My name is Tom Bentley. I am the Communications and Event Manager for the Confederation of Professional Golf. So once again, welcome to you all for this, to this CPG Masterclass Series webinar. And without further ado, I'll uh, pass you over to Russell, who's going to be presenting on your personal practice plan to develop coaching skills. Russell. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you very much to all the coaches that are listening in. I hope uh, you're in a position where you're getting near to being able now to get back out on the golf courses. We started up yesterday in Switzerland, so it's a challenging time. Definitely having to, to rethink a little bit how we do things. And thanks a lot again to the CPG for having this chance to uh, present some ideas. So a little bit of my background, first of all, so that people understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'm British, as you may uh, hear by the accent, but I ended up in Switzerland in uh, 2001. And I've been a head professional at a golf club since 2004, where I'm generally mainly coaching. Uh, in about sort of 2006, 2007, I got interested in further education, and that led to me being involved in the Swiss PGA uh, further education setup. Ended up uh, looking on the standing on the committee and really taking care of everything after final examinations. So we can say sort of continue continuous professional development and two of my questions I've always had as a person is what do I have to do to become a great coach um, maybe some people look at that slightly differently but that was one thing that's always I've asked myself is what do I have to do and through the Swiss PGA has also been then been a case of trying to understand how do we develop great coaches what do we need to do obviously the CPG is doing some great work there but I've always been of the belief that if I become a more effective golf coach, then I think more people will actually partake in golf coaching. Uh, I help them get better and we all become more successful. And something I'll come back to later on and why is this maybe valid to what I'm saying is my roots, my, my beliefs have been developed from these sort of four strands, these branches. I'm still a practicing coach. I'm doing that every day, generally. Uh, I've just spent three years doing a master's in sports coaching at the University of Birmingham. I was very fortunate to go through that program. And my thesis was in the area of professional development and coach learning. I've coached developer through the Swiss PGA. I've done that role for seven years. I've just finished my time for the Swiss PGA. Learned a lot there. And I spent a lot of time reflecting on my own learning and the learning of the other people around me that have helped me to develop. So to give you a little bit of a rundown of what we're gonna try and do in this 30 minutes is we're gonna try and think a little bit about knowledge of coaching. So what do you need to know? Very, very short recap on that. We're gonna go into the knowledge of the coach. So actually you yourselves, um, the mind of the coach especially, and then hopefully uh, think a little bit about some actions that you might be able to take going forwards, especially once we get back to working normally. So a question that we're gonna try and answer in this 30 minutes is how could I use my learning resources that for me is time and money most effectively moving forwards. So really important, this comes, all of these diagrams in the next few pages come from the golf coaching framework that came about when golf became an Olympic sport and good coaching will always start with a participant. I'm sure most people are pretty clear on this and the needs of the participants are going to be slightly different. So we've got obviously normal, maybe re recreational golfers, we've got performance, but we have to start a little bit with the performer. 
the definitions of effective coaching do very slightly, but again, it's about the person. It's about their needs, their wants. So what we're trying to do here is, is look maybe and take a holistic approach at the golfer to make sure that they actually get what they came for. So competence, confidence, connection, character, caring. These are the words that come up uh, in definitions in all sports, not just golf. And I think it was uh, great to be able to look outside of golf sometimes at this, this whole practice. When we now go on to what are we coaching, this is maybe something that's a little bit more familiar to ourselves. We've got at the top of the table um, regarding golf professional knowledge. We have the sport, the golfers, and all of these traditional things that we probably do CPD on. We're, we're trying to find new ways of helping people, coaching theory, how do we actually uh, create motor learning situations? How do we develop skill? Next, in every sport, and coaching we always look at the interpersonal parts this is the the context this is our communication skills maybe more soft skills we could say and then the last thing down the bottom left which is what i'm talking about today is actually intrapersonal knowledge that's do i understand myself as a coach so my own coaching philosophy my beliefs and the lifelong learning so this is the area that i really sort of looked at and I question whether this list is upside down. I believe uh, my bias is that without this, the, the lifelong learning, the other stuff probably will never happen. So I'm maybe one day when I've got some time, might ask Mr. Gilbert Colte and ask them uh, why they actually put lifelong learning for coaches right at the bottom. Maybe that should be at the top. But at the end of the day, all of you sitting there now have some form of knowledge going around in your heads. I've deliberately put that in lots of different colors. It's a little bit of a mess because maybe we haven't actually sorted out what we're coaching. So the left-hand framework might actually help you sort out certain things. And that's really important for our actions going forward, but also to understand what we're actually coaching. So the left-hand framework will always help you uh, to understand what you could learn. And when we go forwards, we'll think a little bit about the actions that you can take. So we've got two areas where we can actually get knowledge or you know, how do we get knowledge. On the left-hand side, we have our own golfing experience, our own coaching experience, and all of the informal and inform, informal and formal education that we've done. So, for example, if you've had a great coach as a kid, that will have influenced you. If you've had a great tutor through your PGA training, everything that you've done to this day, your beliefs about coaching will have been shaped by some form of event. And if we now go forward, what do you now could or could you do? going forward is we've really got these options and this is actually not just about coaching this is how people learn to do jobs on the left we've got mediated learning so formal learning would be like your pga qualifications you get an award you can go on some clinics and seminars it's a little bit non-formal but on the right and this was the area that i really took an interest in in my theory it was like what do people do unmediated uh, their own self-directed learning. We know that self-directed learning in your own questions is very, very powerful. So one of the questions here is, okay, I've got some form of expert I'm gonna have to speak to, to to help me learn, but now I'm driving the truck. Here, the PGA maybe is determining what you learn. On this side, it's a little bit you're determining it. Okay, and my job in the next sort of 15 minutes now probably is to try and help you understand a little bit of what we can do better here. So we're now going to go into your mind, into your brain. And what we have here is knowledge and the literature is pretty clear that we've got this sort of three different types of knowledge when we're doing a job. We've got declarative knowledge, we've got procedural knowledge and we've got conditional knowledge. 
And what I'm going to do is take sort of five minutes to unpack each of these so that you understand what they are and also understand and be a little bit critical about each of them. So declarative knowledge, first of all, is very simple. It's knowing about something. Um, if I want to go and learn French, I could just pick up a French dictionary and now have some French words in my hand. I can't speak French, uh, but having a dictionary in my hand is a way of getting uh, declarative knowledge. And so obviously the actions I can do to get this knowledge, I can read books a very traditional way. I can obviously speak to people. And we've got this new area here, what we call online connectivism. It's when people are now linked. So we think, okay, I can go and Google anything. I can find stuff out really, really quickly. And this is what we really call is, is sort of classical learning. So we can offer qualifications, we can offer courses, put people through exams and give us some nice certificates at the end. And we can test actually declarative knowledge very, very easily. So this is often sort of initial training and ongoing training in new areas. Now, if we're gonna be critical, if you decide at the end of this, you want some new information on biomechanics, let's just go through some things that you need to be aware of. I'm gonna start on top left. Uh, be aware of the amount, okay? Can I actually take the correct amount of knowledge that it's going to be of use. I speak to a lot of coaches that say I've watched X, Y, and Z on some form of Instagram or Facebook or whatever platform, and now they just can't make sense of it. It's all too much. If we go round down to the left, evidence and bias. Who's actually giving you that information? What's that evidence behind it? What research have they done? What's that bias? You know, do they, are they acting as a teacher? Are they acting as a salesman? So we need to be aware of this when we start engaging. It doesn't matter if we're reading a book, going online, talking to people, everybody's going to have an evidence and a bias. I, I certainly have, I understand mine. The next thing, if we carry on down on the bottom is your own personal needs. So how's this relevant to the people you're coaching? Is it really going to help? If we go up to the top right hand side, this phrase was something that suddenly made a lot of sense to me. It was what we call behaviorism. A lot of education is someone telling you how to behave. So someone comes on a course and says, this is how I do it. This is how I expect you to do it. So I just be, get people to be aware now maybe that, you know, do you have a say? Is it a two way conversation or are people simply telling you what to do? Relevance, um, is it pitched at your level? The master's degree for me was the hardest thing. I walked into a university and I really struggled at the start because I had to learn some stuff that was pretty unrelevant for me at that particular time. And it was very, very challenging. So if we don't get the, the level right, if you're reading an academic paper on biomechanics and you don't know the basic functions of a human body, you probably missed the point. And the last thing, and I say this in a, in a little bit of fun, but this is actually a real word that came up in uh, some of the papers, edutainment. If we're especially acting on online sources, am I entertaining myself or am I engaged in learning? So be aware of that. There's some fantastic presenters out there. Um, and this point comes that actually as teachers, we may need to be more entertaining for sure. And also, you know, entertainers, do they really have the educational needs of people? Do they understand those? So this diagram here it will help you if you're looking at any form of new information, just be wary of those points going forwards. We're gonna go now to the second part of the brain or the second part in this sort of idea. And this is what we call the procedural knowledge. It's knowing how to do something. So, I might get a list of instructions and I might start to actually do them. And this procedural knowledge is basically learning by doing. We are now getting our hands dirty. We are actually having a real experience. So I know from my own reflections, I went on a lot of coaching courses and I never got to coach. I had a lot of people telling me how to coach. I never was there being involved. It's great to see in other sports that this is changing. 
I'm not sure we're still that far in golf. But if you want to learn, one of the times I had twice I've had to give very good mentors of mine golf lessons. It's the most scary thing, but it's a fantastic learning experience. And we call this, you know, you start to construct your own knowledge in your head of doing the job. Um, situated in context is what that means is you should be ideally learning in your job, on your job, on the range, on the golf course, and not in a classroom because we're coaches and we're actually giving go coaching sessions. So it's much more effective and meaningful when we're actually trying to learn out on the golf course or while we're actually giving coaching. So let's again be a little bit critical about developing procedural knowledge. Support. I know when I became a head professional in 2004, all my support disappeared. I was on my own and I'm very fortunate to have been introduced to people along the way who have helped me and actually guided me and asked me questions and challenged my values. So any young assistants who end up in a first job, you need a support network of people that are gonna be able to bounce ideas off. Feedback. I. I'm probably still fairly weak at asking my clients what they think of what I've just done with them. I'm getting better at it. I challenge myself to do it, but we need feedback on how good, uh, and this especially for our own bias. If we go down even further, who's leading the coaching session? Am I leading it? Is it my ideas about the golf swing or am I listening to the person that I'm coaching? Are they, asking things are they telling me things that i may be not picking up on so it's very very wary there's a great chapter in the new golf science book from toms and uh, dr martin toms and dr jonathan wright and it just talks about coaches leading or ideally person leading a coaching session if we go on to the right top right what process do you have what framework do you have when you actually deliver a coaching session really really important um how does it start what's the middle part how does it end what's the follow-ups what's the ongoing support that's a great way to be able to do the job linking a little bit into the support is the alternative solutions if you're not getting the results you desire how can you find out about other ways to do the job better it's okay we're all going to make mistakes but where do I get those ideas from? Where are my own knowledge gaps? And ultimately, we're gonna to have to be really hard uh, with ourselves, but really fair and say, well, how good of results am I getting? That's, that's my ability to do the job. So I need to probably have a way to gauge the results and that's based naturally on the people I'm coaching's needs. So just to remind you here, this page here is gonna be a great help. If you're actually doing your job, and you want to think about, okay, when I'm there on my own, on the range, just remember these questions, reflect on them, and start to try and find possible solutions. And naturally, your ability to do the job will be increased, I hope. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into what we call the conditional knowledge. Um, this for me, I've written it here, knowing what to do when and why. I've been fortunate enough to spend some time with some fantastic coaches and they not only can tell me a lot, but they can tell me why they do it. Um, I see a lot of people maybe online um, or they can just say stuff, uh, but maybe they might not be able to explain why. So we're going to unpack a little bit of conditional knowledge. And this is for me, something the great coaches really have and helps them uh, get results. So I, and I call that coaching skill. These coaches, they are reflecting constantly. When I speak to great coaches, they are constantly asking new questions. So they're going through that in their own mind. They're thinking very wide. They've got a, a, a breadth of knowledge. So if we go back to our original framework, they understand most of that framework. But the next thing I realized when speaking to these great coaches is that in fact, they're also utilizing others' expertise. 
for example, we may have a biomechanist that has a very deep knowledge of biomechanics. They might not have a wide knowledge of coaching, but they might have the pieces to the puzzle that we need. So I see, especially if we look at tour players, there's definitely a change, but I also see this starting to happen in, in golf. And if we think about, I'm going to take Manchester United as a football team, every single coach is working for the benefit of Manchester United and their results, whether it's in the under 19 or the first team. So we have to know uh, to be a great coach, a lot of things, a breadth, but we may not need to know it really, really deeply, but we might have to actually have people to be able to, to call up when we do need that deep knowledge. Really important, I think, again, I come back to this point, is we're always putting the person first. Um, so a phrase, I'm sorry, I don't know who said this. I wrote it down something. Participant-led, coach-driven, I love that. But it aligns with an idea that's come around this here, PJDM, professional judgment and decision making. And that's a, an idea that expert coaches have or, or make great professional judgment and they know how to make good decisions. And this is possibly what we're aiming for when we're trying to develop great coaches. Coaches will often come up with different answers. That's okay as long as you can justify it based on good evidence. And the last thing here, the absolutely exceptional coaches and for me, one of the things that's been the most challenging is start to teach others. One form of that is mentoring. But when you actually start to put forward those ideas that you have and your beliefs to the next generation, one that keeps the knowledge in our industry and actually makes us all stronger. If I disappeared off the face of the planet tomorrow, then everything that I've done in my MSc is gone. So I need to maybe help some other people understand that. And secondly is, to be able to teach it to people, we have to understand it very, very well. And that's a real challenge. So if you're trying to work out how all of these things fit together, here's a few ideas and the actions that you need to go through to be very, very at the top of your game. So really when we start to get to the important parts and start to understand how does it possibly look, if I'm developing declarative knowledge, I might go online to get a video. If I'm doing procedural knowledge, I'll, I'll actually go through a golf lesson. I'll have an experience. But if I really want to start to join the dots and become skillful, it's worth taking time to reflect on the actions I've done within a lesson. We can reflect prior to giving a session. We can reflect during, and we can actually reflect after. There's loads of different techniques on this. A couple I've written down here, five minute reflection, just at the end of the day, putting five minutes in your plan just to sit down and write down events, questions, observations, ideas, so you have some form of structure. You can film a session, obviously now very, very easy. Please get your client's permission. Tell them that it's just for your own use to reflect on your own work. I'd advise people, if they're gonna do any form of reflection to do that with support at the start. Uh, there were some studies they did in rugby coaching and the guys absolutely ripped themselves to shreds when they saw them on camera on their own. So a couple of ways there, doing five minutes at the end of the day or filming sessions is a great way to actually look at what you've done. Self-direct, if you wanna be really good, you're gonna need your own questions but always base your questions about the needs of your client. So self-direction is very powerful. It's part of motivation theories. It's going to help you. Construction, knowledge construction, reflective writing, activities that take you out of your comfort zone. There's some very modern day. So instead of people taking exams, some sports coaching now, they're actually getting people to write journals. Academic journals is the hardest of anything, but... You can write a blog where you maybe share it with people and get some feedback. This is much more powerful learning than actually you sitting down maybe and, and taking an exam just on something you've read. I just ask people if they're gonna start creating content and sharing it, please ensure your sources are valid and possibly before you start putting out to the big wide world internet, share it in a trusted group and get some 
feedback to make sure that your sources and your ideas are pretty sound. Because we've obviously seen over the last few weeks how quickly fake news travels. On the top right, you need to connect to people. And I've written a phrase here and I will read it because I think it's very important. Create effective collaborative social learning networks free of egos and salesmen. Okay, we can do that online, we can do that in person. We want people around us that are gonna help us. I do pay people for support. I, I don't expect everybody to give everything for free. I have people I pay and I'm very fortunate. I have people to give me that time for free. Um, but obviously if I'm gonna start writing checks for, for something, I need to know what's actually being delivered. We can critique, we need to be, Criticism is, is positive and negative. We need to look at our, our, our own practice and be possibly use critical friends, mentors, to actually start to be hard and nice about our performance. And like I said here, just again, a real, real thing. If you're gonna look at any form of information, always question the source. Who is the expert? Who did the research? Um, there's a lot and a big difference between academic research and, and some research to make things look nice. So understand the sources of your knowledge when you're looking at things online or in the real world. And uh, you should be able to start to make sense of uh, where it's coming from. So I've put together a little action plan for you. Six key words that you might wanna think about, especially when we go back to our real world, let's say, and we're working every day. We can't sit there and watch 10 hours of videos and think we've learned loads. We're gonna have to do it a little bit and hopefully ongoing. So number one is the what. What knowledge do I need? Use the framework at the start. Just try and be honest with yourself or chat to a few colleagues and understand where could I possibly get better? Think about who, who are the people that could support you going forwards? So obviously every one of us is different. We've all got different needs, but who are those people that might have those things that will support that? The how, what processes are gonna take place in your brain? Okay, how am I gonna do that? Am I gonna write? Am I gonna test myself? Am I gonna reflect? Something's gotta happen in your brain to actually advance you. Where's this gonna happen? Is it online? Am I gonna fly somewhere to see someone? Uh, is it gonna happen on my own range? That's a real, uh, important question, but as I say, this, this safe and collaborative environment, probably better than uh, some Facebook groups that I see where arguments seem to happen every second day. When, when do I actually do this? How do I fit this into my working week? So for me, if you're gonna uh, actually try and challenge yourself to be as good as possible, it might be worth taking your diary, taking your plan and actually booking a little bit of time every week or every second week to have some learning. And lastly, you know, how do I take action? How do I review that? That's a little bit of a reflective process there that is hopefully going to help you um, on your on your way, so to speak, to continually get better. So I hope it's a little bit of an understanding of yourself now. That was my goal. I hope that people have started to think a little bit about the actions that they take, especially in the modern day world with internet. Um, if we can save a little bit of time, save a little bit of money and be a little bit more effective, then we can probably all advance our skills a little bit quicker. For those academics in the room, there's some references um, of some of the papers, but there's a lot more in there that I've actually um, quoted from. And for anybody that's sort of interested in continuing this discussion, then uh, my email address is there, my phone number is there, you can WhatsApp me, you can email me. I've just started this, this set, set, um, shutdown time has allowed us to get a few ideas off the ground. There's a little bit of a website that is coming together. At the moment, you can literally drop your email address in there. If you'd like some further information, we're gonna try and put some resources together in the next couple coming months just to help coaches actually in this area. So feel free to drop the email address in there. And uh, I thank you very much and wish you all a great restart to the season, whenever that is. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Russell. Um, very interesting. Just before we move on, uh, if you do have any questions for Russell, please post them in the chat below um, and I'll go through them now and ask them um, for 10, 15 minutes. While we're waiting for that, I guess I'll just get started uh, with a question, Russell. Just yes. wondering, you mentioned a little bit earlier about um, sort of COVID-19 and the sort of fake news and that sort of stuff. I think um, it's quite a sumptuous, but I think there's a definite um, mood amongst people to analyse and reflect on the information that's being put out there uh, yep. and, you know, look at its validity, look at its reliability, etc. Just wondering if that is translated into coaches from, in your own opinion at the minute, are enough coaches engaging in that reflective process uh, or do they need to uh, improve on it in some way? I think we've been more aware of it, the people I'm speaking to, because we've got time on our hands. Yeah. Um, however, what I think is a very challenging thing is marketing. And I say that in a nice way. There's, there's some amazing products that help coaches develop. Um, some cost more than others, but obviously they all need to fit our needs. Um, and then naturally, and I say this from the side that I've been involved in a PGA and I get stuff sent to us that people want to, so to speak, sell to coaches. And in all honesty, there's not a lot in it. Um, you know, there's, there's, the evidence is pretty poor. It's an, someone's opinion. And, and I think that's very hard because if it's got a nice logo and a nice website, um, we can be fooled sometimes. So it's challenging. And also, as I said, we can examine this uh, declarative knowledge but actually the conditional knowledge that someone's got, we don't really know until we start having deep conversations with them. Yep. So, you know, can people really get the results in coaching is, is, you know, at the end of the day, it's easy if you're coaching maybe top players, but we can have expert coaches in beginners and, you know, they might have no name and people, if, if we put them on maybe as a PGA and we say, this guy's a, a genius at coaching beginners, but it's like, because he's not in the world golf top, hall of fame it's like no one takes him seriously but mm. actually he's become an expert in a niche so it's all about who we're coaching and and i think that's a little bit of the the, the challenge when we're when we're listening to these people uh the second thing i just say and i said that also so nicely when you're going through is some fantastic people um who get great results but then they're not great educators so to speak to, to coach the coaches. So I think that can be sometimes a bit challenging. They've learned to be a great coach, a golf coach, but not, uh, not a necessarily a, a great teacher of coaches. Yeah, so sure. it's, it's an interesting, there's, there's lots of spokes on the wheel, so to speak. And uh, I, I think that coaches just need to be aware. Academic research, I never understood because uh, I'm very fortunate to go to a university at the age of like, late thirties. And I never realized what the hell it was all about in all honesty until I did it. Um, and to do a master's in that and to see the rigor that these people go through to do something instead of maybe saying, yeah, I did this test with someone and they hit 10 balls and they're now better. Um, it's a different world, but it's quite a, it's quite a challenging world to get in, involved in. Um, just wondering in terms of, I remember when I did, um, I did a reflective, a reflective journal for my coaching modules, part of my training. Just wondering, and, and really what that taught me was, that, well, I didn't even know I had a philosophy or a bias before, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but doing that was really interesting because it, I found out a lot about myself as a coach, also as a person. But ultimately, I just wanted to ask, how is your... Has your bias changed or your philosophy on your own coaching from the point of when you first completed your training to where you are now? Do you think Massively. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm four. So my father's a PGA professional. So I was pretty much a copy paste of whatever we did until I went to Switzerland. And then when I ended up in Switzerland, I had a lot of other influences. In all honesty, my, my challenges were as a coach, um, I never really understood how to reflect. So I kept going. I spent a lot of money going to America, doing courses, doing certificates, and I couldn't make sense of anything. I just kept, I need this certificate. I need that certificate. I've got to do this course. And oh, this is out now. 
So I was chasing declarative knowledge. Um, and that was for me, I spent a lot less time looking at my own practice and myself and, and university to challenge me to do that. So it was very powerful. It's very hard. It's the easiest thing. I know we try and do some of this in training already with the trainees in Switzerland and people sometimes sort of don't do it. It's like, yeah, it's the thing I can just sort of get round. I, as long as I do the exams and answer the right questions, <laughs> I'll get my certificate. But actually the powerful learning comes from when you start to question yourself. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, my, my philosophies have just evolved by actually sitting down. We were, we were requested to sort of reflect on our own practice and I naturally reflected on a lot of my mentors that I've been around and the experiences they've shared with me to sort of come to this conclusion, so to speak. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, a couple of questions coming in. I've got one from Clara and um, she's talking about the conflict between giving a student what they want and actually using your golf knowledge that so the conflict between what you think should be happening um, and giving the student what they want just wondering if you've got any on the job experience on how to deal with that because ultimately it's about Clara yeah going. Clara great question um, I'd go through it for you if you go back to the framework and you look at it like this you've got your own beliefs and the for me if we went through that that's the intrapersonal knowledge. And the next thing for me is then the interpersonal. I need to connect and build trust with that person. It doesn't matter if it's a tour player or a beginner. I think that is more important. And that's why I question whether this whole framework is upside down. If I get that, I get buying from the student. I can then do whatever I want. I was probably the other way around at the start. I would generally say, this is what you've got to do. And autonomy is a very powerful motivating factor so if I can develop some form of trust and I can get the person to sort of buy in and then I can sell it to them as their idea um, I can actually guide them and I like this we sort of have this uh, just to get off topic slightly but we hear maybe of sort of teaching I tell someone how to behave and then we hear sort of of coaching or, or we're going to let someone self-organize something. And I sit in the middle there as I think we can guide someone based on their needs. Sometimes I'm going to have to teach them a little bit more. And sometimes I'm going to let them have to explore. I'm always driving it, but I'm, I'm really listening to them. But I honestly think on to that question on the job experience, you've got to have that relationship with the clients. First of all, it doesn't matter if you've got the best knowledge in the world and they don't really buy in or have that relationship with you. I don't think they're going to jump hoops and get better. And that brings into question so a little bit the early phases of a new client, doesn't it, Ben? In how do you build that relationship right at the start, first lesson, make an impression, etc. I was fortunate enough, one of my early experiences is I got to go out to America and spend the whole day uh, on the driving range with Martin Hall, who obviously anybody who watches Golf Channel will know Martin. I watched him coach 10 people, 10 hour sessions or nine. Um, he had from LPGA tour player to a seven year old, he had a 60 year old businessman. It was, it was a complete eclectic of people. And his thing and it really stood to me it was it was you know give them the lesson they want and he was pretty clear you know some of those people he had a long-term relationship with and some of the people he knew they were there just looking for that answer that quick fix he gave them the lesson they wanted but i would say the ones he'd work with longer he was giving them the lesson they needed yeah and that was so, um that was a key point raised if, for some people who have been following this series over the last few weeks. It was a key point raised by Andrew Rice last week in that personality is really important in order to be able to develop a relationship with somebody. So again, just something to probably... Play. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we are, it's funny, we sort of, I, I, someone said something about coaches being salesmen on, on a webinar there on, or on one of these Instagram things the other week. And I thought it was a great thing, but... What's important is we sell the person what they need, not what we want to sell them. 
Yeah, uh, that's that's then you then you you're gonna get some great results. Yeah, that's the key difference. So uh, definitely, you know, if you're able to reflect on, on where your knowledge is at, then you'll be able to find alternative answers. The problem is if people have weak knowledge or they have a strong bias, they will often tend to say the client can't do that or you know, it's not my problem. Yeah, for sure. Um, just having a look at some of these questions else. We've got one from Alvaro. Um, in your opinion, Russell, are there are coaches becoming more open-minded to new trends, or are they sticking to their own system and sort of persevering with that? I believe um, that every coach has their individual philosophy, um, and so if you say you know open-minded to new trends, I think people are definitely understanding. Uh, I own a Trapman, a 3D system, and a force plate. However, I brand myself as Russell Warner because, or in fact, we actually brand ourselves as a golf academy for the golf club. It's not about me. Um, so I feel that I have a system, but the system is always based around the, the people that we're coaching. So I think, you know, I'm open to any new trends. Um, I was in Houston in, in November and was having some, a chat with a very well-known scientist about some ideas of learning golf to, to sound. And it was, um, it's based around how they, re, they teach people to learn movements if they've been like disabled or, or had accidents. The funny thing is that the research is so early in its stage. It's like, you know what, in 10 years time, this might be the answer to everything. But the, the research isn't there at the moment to say, I'm going to go out onto the driving range. I might experiment with something and, you know, I'll watch the research evolve, but I'm not going to go and run off tomorrow. Um, if we look at 90%, I think, of good coaching, uh, we, we know more or less. There's going to be some advances. There always is. But just coaching research is massive in the last 20 years. And a lot of it's come to very, very similar conclusions. So, you know, that's, that's important. So I don't think there's new trends. There's always going to be some new understanding of how the brain learns movement, how we learn skills. But a lot of it is already known. And people have done it for hundreds of years. People have coached people for hundreds of years. So <laughs> I don't I think, think it's it, like... It's becoming more aware in the golfing context though, isn't it? Like you said, over the last 20 years or so, research into coaching and understanding into coaching for golf specifically is becoming more Definitely. and more prevalent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of... If you understand the background of what I presented there, some of this has been taken from how people learn jobs. Others have been teaching how to uh, teach people, you know, teachers, school teachers. Then we've got sort of sports coaching, generic, and then we've got research on golf coaching. And, and you can sort of understand at the end of the day, this is a job. This is a, 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 an occupation that we've all chosen to do. And then from there, well, we have an element of teaching pedagogy is the, the official term. And then from there, you know, we're in sports and then from there we're in golf, but we shouldn't separate and say, Oh, we're golf because we're special. Uh, there's a lot of overlap to other things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, just to finish off, one more question. Um, if you could have one piece of advice to all the listeners on, on the call today from oh, today's, <laughs> <laughs> put you under pressure from uh, today's webinar, from your own experience, from your own academic learning, what would be your one biggest piece of advice for the listeners? I reckon at the end of every day, one, write down one question you want to find the answer to. Okay, there you go. That's that's uh, that's everybody's homework. <laughs> there you go. I thank you very much for the, the opportunity. And if anybody's still listening, you're not falling asleep, uh, then then contact me. Fire questions through, um, because I think support is sometimes lacking in this area. I think there's a lot of support in other areas, but I think in this area, possibly it's a, it's a little bit lacking. So happy to help anybody who's got questions. Yeah, and I would urge that as well. First of all, thank you, Russell, for offering that. I would urge that Russell's got a lot of experience working this, uh, working with the Swiss PGA. Is um, and as as you've seen over the course of this last half an hour, he's uh, he's very knowledgeable in this area. So just um, give him a shout if you do need any help. Just before you leave, I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for attending today's webinar. 
Um, we have got four more this week. One tomorrow uh, with Todd Kirstead on adaptive golf, um, focusing on sort of disability golf and the financial benefits you can have to your business for doing that. Um, on Thursday, we have Ryan Brandenburg, which is sort of destination marketing, club marketing, um, which will be really interesting, especially with golf courses opening up back up. And then on Friday is a certain Alistair Spink focusing on a community of female golfers as well. It'll be a really interesting uh, webinar as well. So if you do want to attend those, please do register on the Masterclass homepage. And then finally, just, just want to, again, just want to say thank you to, for all attending and thank you to you, Russell, for giving up your time um, to speak to everybody today. I found that very interesting and I hope everybody else did as well. Uh, My pleasure. Other than that, I hope everybody has a great evening and hopefully we'll see you again this week. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great time.